Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamer's Edge podcast. With Nicholas, I write video game reviews for thedreamersedge.com. And I am Dimitri, webmaster of thedreamersedge.com and movie and television critic. And uh, first, I, I want to apologize. We went through another unexpected hiatus just a couple of weeks this time. Eh, mistakes happen. They do, but uh, I, I, we've taken some steps so that that doesn't happen anymore. We will be on a weekly basis again uh, for the foreseeable future. Cool. What we're going to talk about this week is the fact that the major labels, music labels, I should say, have all announced that by the end of 2012... Uh, they will stop using the CD altogether. The CD will be dead. Wow. Yeah. So I thought there would be a nice bridge for a conversation a little bit about formats, uh, the different formats that we've gone through over the years for movies, games, and music, and talk about where the future lies, I should say. Yeah. Well, that, that's crazy, though. No, I mean, when I buy like music, I like to have it in a hard format so that if my hard drive crashes... You know, or something. I still have the hard format. You know, I, I like putting it on the MP3 players or just putting it on my, my computer so I don't have to get the CD every time. But I still like to have this hard copy with me. And I like to pay for that thing. Yeah. When I heard this, my first reaction was sort of to bemoan that. But then my second reaction was to realize that I haven't bought a CD in years. I've, I, I, I download legally the MP3s either through iTunes or Amazon or HMV. Is it because there's there's no real um, if you you only like a few songs from that artist, or just that you don't feel there's the whole album you want to buy, or is it just more convenient for you? For certain songs that are hard to find, uh, you know, or like certain albums that are, have become hard to find. Yeah, uh, you know, like I want to buy a Dulce Pontes al- uh, album because I like three songs of it. I guess I guess there's a song selection aspect of it too. Like, even if I would be interested in trying all the other songs that comes on the album, it's going to be an imported album because that's a Portuguese band, right? Yeah. And that's going to cost me like $27, $28 easily. That's cheap. That, that's cheap. I remember <clears throat> once uh, buying Cloud9 from George Harrison. Yeah. And it, it was like, it had to be imported. And when if they finally imported it for me, I was like, it's $35. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I can see the advantage there, yeah, indeed, of uh, downloading. Especially since a lot of sites now, what they do is uh, they offer you a, uh, a rebate if you download all the songs from an album. Like, it'll be a buck a song. But if you download the album, which has like 12 songs in it, it'll be like 6 or $8. Yeah. Having said that, I will miss having, you know, a pamphlet to look through. I mean, that was sort of part of yeah. my musical experience when I was young, you know. You have these singers. In my case, it was like Al- Alanis before she was Alanis Morissette. And I wanted the poster that came with it and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, I enjoy it as well, the whole album thing. Um, I've never really bought an album because I only wanted one or two songs. You know, I'm, I've never been that way. When I buy an album, it, it's it's damn sure because I like the whole thing. But yeah, looking back, like you said, most of the more recent albums I bought are um, from Gerdal or an artist here in Quebec called François Pérus, where it's a comedy album. And just buying one track would make no sense to me. <laughs> so you, ha- you pretty much buy the whole thing. But those are really like really the only like albums I've bought for, for like songs I felt like listening to like in the 80s. You know, I'm not going to bo- go buy a cheap trick album. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. I'm just going <laughs> to get the song I want. <laughs> Because I'm really a big fan of the 80s, so to me, that is a lot easier. So, And even in compilations, you're stuck with a bunch of songs you don't want. You know, I really don't want We Build This City, and it's an all 80s compilation. <laughs> so you pick and choose, and you make your own compilation. So I guess in that way, uh, it is true that I don't buy that many albums. Yeah, and I think in that aspect, we represent the, uh, most of the consumers. I, I think... The reason why the labels have given up on it, it's because the consumers have given up on it quite some time ago. Yeah. One of the great formats that I have found, though, that might be an interesting alternative to that is those uh, download cards I've seen in, in stores. You have a little plastic card that looks like a nice little collectible card. All the cards have the same size and it has a picture of the singer on it and a picture from the album and like some stuff written in the back. And yeah. also has a code where you can go log in and download all the songs from that album. And you can reuse it? Can you reuse it or is it just a one-time use card? I have no idea. I never bought one. Okay. Because if you can reuse it, that'd be great. Because again, your hard drive crashes. Mm-hmm. Well, you have your card. You can get, you can get it back. But I can see that being a problem, though, because, you know, what prevents you from passing the card around to all your friends. Yeah. So it's probably a one-time one use thing. 
Although the, the alternative to that might be, you know, you register under your name, you know, uh, for that service, and then you enter the code. Yeah. So then they know who enters what code. And if you're, if like two different users are, are entering that code, that might be an yeah, issue. Yeah, that's true. There, there are ways of working around that. You're right. And you, you have your still collectible, though it's, it's just the card, and those things tend to, you know, end up in the bottom of a drawer, and then all of a sudden you clean one day, and it's like, oh, these cards, whatever, and you just throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> you put them, like, you got to put them in those little plastic bags, like those uh, baseball cards or uh, uh, yeah. comic book cards. Do they still exist? I have no yes, idea. Yes, they do. And those little pages turn. It's like, look, I have this album. <laughs> you come off like a total geek. <laughs> well, it's no better than when you know you have your giant CD collection and you you know you, have, you show it to people and yeah, sure, go go right through my collection and see how awesome I am. You know, it's it's kind of the same thing with those cards. You know, look at all the cards I have. It's... That's true, and it takes less space, which is sort of what I like about that because well, okay, just from the consumer's point of view. You know, I don't need a four and a half anymore. I can have a three and a half because I'm not wasting an entire room on my CD collection. I don't have that many CDs, but I know yeah, people who do. It's going to be a lot less cumbersome when, when you only have cards instead of like uh, so many CDs everywhere. Yeah, with those big CD towers. Yeah, the towers that are hell to move because oh. you, you take out the, you take out the CDs, you leave them in the towers. With that, they're just <laughs> so annoying to move. Yeah, and and there's a part of you that always resents having to take the CDs out of the tower just to move them and put them in a box. Yeah. So there's always like one move where you'll try to just tape the uh, CDs to the tower and try to transport <laughs> that. And like I I kid you not, like the tower just like fell apart in my arms. I was going down the stairs. Yeah. Tower gets surprisingly heavy with those CDs, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was sort of like this weird thing, like where pieces of board fell down the stairs, and then in my hands I held like a scotch tape t- a fl- a flower with CDs attached to it, like <laughs> leaves. It was the like, weirdest thing. <laughs> wow. So I, I don't recommend that. But with cars, you can just carry the binder with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always the same like when your computer crashes, which is my biggest worry because I have lost a lot of information on mm-hmm. you know hard drive crashes. You never think, oh, it's it's just music. I'm gonna ma- you know I'm gonna make uh, backups of it. But then when you make backups, you're stuck with the CD problem again. You know you're making CDs of your backups, so you're still stuck with the hundreds of CDs. Oh no, I keep them on a flash drive. My backup. Okay. Yeah. It's also the thing that I can carry with me as well. You know, it's like if I'm not carrying my laptop. But I'm going away. I'll carry my flash drive. So oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't think the backup issue is that bad if you back up. But that does mean that the studios have to relax on their, like, it can only be on one computer devices. Yeah, that's true. terrible. Yeah. And, you know, please enter the password to listen to this track. Like, are, you, are you serious? <laughs> no. Okay, track one. Enter the password. Track two. Enter another password. You're like, no. uh, come on. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Because the pirated copies don't have that. So you're sort of encouraging people who actually bought your product to go, well, I kind of want the pirate copy so I don't have to do this all the time. I know. I've got that that problem with video games where, you know, it's it's so hard to to have all those cartridges all the way around that, yeah, well, I'll I'll get the ROM and it's so much easier. You know, I like this game and I actually own it, but I'm not going to drag all my my video game collection to me when I move. I, I like went to the United States and I went to France and I, I might go to Copenhagen. But it's another thing with with the games. A lot of computer games are pretty much digital download now. Mm-hmm. And I, I again had the mixed feeling of again you have your hard drive crashing, um, and it's gone. But you know, pe- there there are a lot of companies like Blizzard. You basically register for the game and you have an account. You don't have to have a bunch of CDs around with you all the time. If you you know your hard drive crashes, that's fine. You just you know log in, re-download the game, and it's yours. So much more practical because you know there was always escalation with video games. It started like with one floppy, and then it went to like ten floppies, and all of a sudden you have the CD. And then anyway, it's there's ten CDs <laughs> exactly, and now you have one or two DVDs per game. And it, you know it's just a matter of time before it goes to like ten DVDs, mm. and until the next format, and <laughs> then. <laughs> So I really enjoy the fact that you can get them, you know, online the way Blizzard does it. It's not just you download it and if, if your computer crashes, well, we're sorry, but you have to buy it again. No, download it and you have your account saved with them. So if you you need it again, you re-download it and very practical. Yeah, so essentially what you're buying is a license to download. Exactly, yes. Yeah, no, that's. I think that's ideal for big computer games for sure. Yeah, and I think it's better than uh, you know what they've been trying to do a lot more. It's cloud, or where 
you know, the game is actually on their server, and you have to log into their server to play the game. I don't like that. What happens if cloud crashes or cloud there, there, there's something that goes belly up? Mm -hmm. You paid for that game, you can't play it anymore. Well, what? Well, what's worse than that? What happens if a company goes belly under, or they, they, the the you know, the, they're start, starting to lose money and they're trying to see where they can cut costs, and they realize, well, not enough players are playing that game. Yeah. You paid for that game, you can't play it anymore. That is a problem. I, I and it's a problem I have with Diablo Three that you're going to pay. You have to be online to play it. Yeah. And what happens if Blizzard? You know, goes belly up. It might not happen right now because Blizzard, Blizzard is huge. But if it goes belly up, you can't play the game anymore. At least you know if you bought it digitally, you have it downloaded. It's yours, okay. If the company goes belly up, you, it means you don't have the safety net of having being able to re-download it. But you know, being forced to be online to play it—that's that's something I don't quite like. But again, we go back to though the ideal being to actually have the hard copy, the CDs. Uh, with it in, in some fashion. But uh, CDs are not as great as people think they are with um, video games because the company is really trying to cut down on pirating. Yeah. So they, they, ha they add those very malicious software on the CDs that install themselves as you install the game and you can, it's very hard to get rid of them and they do all kinds of stuff to your computer just to make sure that you know, oh you can only you know get it once and you can't cut, say, copy it to somebody else. The, the, the amount of crap that these CDs install on your computer is insane. Yeah, um, I, I know we've moved on, but I'm just going to come back to it just for a few. But like uh, music, Universal Records, there was a time where they did the same thing. Yeah. Where like when you try to uh, rip the CD onto your computer, it would like install all kinds of mad software. And like it was even worse than that because like as soon as you tried to play it, it would, it would install all that mad software. It was a big deal at the time where I had just taken a habit of, uh, you know, Connecting my computer to uh, to my CD player and just record it from there because I just didn't want any of that crap on my computer. Yeah. So I mean, that's one thing I I really check before buying a game. I, you can get a lot of feedbacks on the internet of you know, what, what does this game install mm -hmm. on my computer in addition to the game? And I've skipped out on a lot of games I wanted to play because no, I don't want that that crap on my computer. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the digital download with a license is great as long as the company doesn't go belly up. And you, you basically have to kind of, you know, cross your fingers and hope it doesn't happen. But couldn't the company technically do the same thing with the digital download? I guess it's true. I guess it's just a matter of trust. Mm. Um, like I know for Blizzard, digital download of Worlds of Warcraft, you have to be online to play it. Because yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's an online role-playing game, so you, you're forced to be online, so that's fine. Um, they're trying to do the pirate thing for Diablo 3 and I, I'm less fine with that. I'm hoping that eventually they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, you don't have to be online anymore. The, the game has run its course, so you know they release a patch, and that patch you can play offline. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm thinking should happen, and I, I'm kind of crossing my fingers, hope happens. Hope aside, though, just sort of realistically, do you think that's something that they might go for, or, or do you think it's very unlikely? It's something that they're going to go for, and they're going to have to, because if not, somebody else will. Uh, I mean, the amount of people out there that love, love games, they had online role-playing games that they loved, and that are defunct now, and they're basically backwards re-engineering them so that they can play them. So if Blizzard doesn't do it, somebody else will. Blizzard might as well eventually do it and have it done the right way. It's hmm, interesting. Um, let's talk about the movies for a second because it, oddly I feel like completely the opposite way about movies than I do about music and the way you do about games. I want the hard copy at all costs for movies. Really? Yeah. I, I, I do not like this whole download to own initiative that they're trying to get us started with. Um, I certainly don't like the streaming initiative that they've been going for. Oh, streaming is bad. Yeah. I mean, it, your internet it hits a glitch, and all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of the movie, like buffering, like you know, that, that's not that kind of kills the movie experience for me. Yeah, right there. But download to own, I don't think it's there yet. The burning process is still so annoying. You are having to burn DVDs and stuff like that. When the technology is is a little better, and we have like flash drive, say for example that you can plug into your DVD player and okay, you have the same thing. I'd be more open to that, but uh, we're not there yet, I think. But that's what they have now. Uh, uh, Western Digital essentially has a hard drive that can play videos on your TV. Okay. That's what they have. So 
for download to own, that's exactly what they're looking at. You, you download it onto that hard drive and it's there as your copy. And that, that thing serves as both your uh, home entertainment system and your library. Okay. What happens when that machine crashes though? I know that's, that's, that's <laughs> sort of a big issue for me. <laughs> yeah. That's why, that's why you need, you need the technology to put them on, you know, reliable flash drives, you know, say for example, you, you, you come up with movie flash drives, mm -hmm. it fits one movie per flash drive and you just plug it in the machine and you download it and then you have your flash drive, kind of like the cards we we're talking about for music. Right. And this little flash drive, you can say, this is Predator, for example, mm -hmm. and you know, you save it somewhere. It, and it's a lot. It, it's a lot smarter than a DVD. A lot less cumbersome. And I, you know, that that would work for me. But I don't. I don't think that's available right now. No, and I don't think that's even where they're going. I think. I think with the success of um, Netflix, yeah. all of the movie studios are all going like Ooh, streaming because everybody's into that. Yeah. In fact, what that's what happened with Netflix is like a lot of studios have sort of removed their collection from Netflix because they want to start their own thing. And it's sort of like now to watch TV through streaming and movies through streaming, you got to get like 16 subscriptions to different studios right yeah. now is where it's headed, which to me is ridiculous. But it's also people are not thinking this through. I mean, it comes from the United States where unlimited uh, bandwidth is sort of uh, the standard. Yeah. But in other countries, it's not. I know. And um, we're in Canada. And like for me, people who get Netflix and all of that is like you're you're completely insane. Because you're paying twice. You're paying once to stream the thing and once for the bandwidth to stream. Yeah. To... We're still lucky because we pay like monthly for internet. I mean, I've had uh, friends who moved to other countries and they couldn't play World of Warcraft anymore because they had to pay the internet per minute. Oh. So imagine that. It, 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 that model doesn't work for in all the countries. It works for the United States and that that's close to pretty much it. Yeah. And eventually they're going to run out of server space for to offer unlimited bandwidth. Eventually they're going to start charging for bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah, I'm all, all for net neutrality and everything, but it's like, it's a dream, seriously. Eventually, the, you know, there's not an unlimited amount of, of bandwidth out there. Mm. And as more and more people use it, it's going to become, you know, so much more restricted. Absolutely. The tubes are going to get clogged. <laughs> And uh, also worry about the company no longer offering that movie. What if they just like, okay, well, nobody's streaming this movie on a regular basis. I'm just going to remove it. And it's like, well, you just, like, as a consumer who liked this movie, you just paid for nothing. You yeah. just lost it. Exactly. Uh, the other alternative we were talking about, though, is download to own, which I think is where they're headed. And I'm not excited about it. But I think consumers are excited enough about it that it might actually turn out to work. Okay. Yeah. Um. Again, the advantages of it save space, but it, like you said, the backup is an issue. And uh, with music, I can back up my entire collection of music on, you know, one or two flash drives. Yeah. Uh, with movies, yeah, that's not going to happen. It's one movie per flash drive, roughly. And e yeah. even then, like the, the, the lower resolution movies on the bigger flash drives yeah. is how it works now. So if you, you're going to like high def, and, you know, all the special features and everything, the flash drives aren't even there yet. And also, I like having the cover. And I have like I like in the box. And I think people do like that. That's why Lord of the Rings gets away with, like, selling a different version of the same <laughs> bloody movie. Where it's like, it's not like even, like, Star Wars was like, I added 30 seconds of footage. It's like, they don't even, it's just a new box. Yeah. And people keep buying it. Well, yeah, they have to get something newer to get, you know, catch the eye, you know. I'm going to put a hologram, I'm going to put, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, it's true. And yeah, if if it's all you know, download to own, you you're gonna you're gonna lose that. Yeah, which is too bad. It's part of the experience for me. I like popping the disc in. I like looking at the box and going like, look the pretty picture. You wouldn't be fine with popping a, like a flash drive in, in a machine and saying you know, kind of the same thing. Well, the flash drive is not too bad because you can actually decorate the flash drive. Yeah. You can put the flash drive in a box. I guess. I guess. Yeah. yeah. That would be fine. But that's where. But it's really the download to own thing. Okay. You can't do that. All right, but there is the environmental concerns about it. I understand download to own would be theoretically better for the environment, not as much transportation. Yeah, that's true. But now that you have the DVD distribution online, where they just mail it to you, that's actually sort of evolving into something very interesting. Uh, there's two TV shows I can think of. Uh, one of them is uh, Ten Things I Hate About You, the series, not the awful movie, but the TV okay. series. Yeah. 
And um, the Matthew Perry TV show from last year called uh, Mr. Sunshine. Okay. Uh, both cult hits, but that did not really engage a wide audience. But it did engage an audience that sort of I wanted on home video. Okay. Now, what they've decided to do is uh, print on demand. You can order a DVD, they'll print it, and they'll mail it to you. Oh, that's cool. But they, Yeah, they only print as much as they need. Speaking of environment and cost effectiveness, that's great. Yeah. yeah. You're not stuck with like hundreds of un unsold um, DVDs that, okay, now we have to, you know, the stores have to bring them back, and then we have to destroy them or yeah. recycle them. Or bury them in the Nevada desert like they did for the ET game cartridges, you know. <laughs> uh, much better. <laughs> yeah. Just as an aside, okay, so we have, I, I've been mentioning the word DVD a lot. And that's because I have not converted to Blu-ray. Okay. Because I don't believe in Blu-ray. But uh, before I get into that, like, how do you feel about the DVD versus Blu-ray thing? Because HD DVD lost to Blu-ray because uh, pornography went with Blu-ray. Okay. The same thing that happened with Beta and VHS a few decades before. Yeah. Um, how I feel? I don't see the difference. You don't? You would pop a DVD or you would pop a Blu-ray. I could not tell you the difference. Awesome. Maybe if you could play them one next to, the next to another, mm -hmm. you know, on the same TV, maybe I would see. But right now, the limiting factors for me and for most of my friends is the TV. Right. And not everybody has converted to HD. And even you get an HD TV, the DVDs are going to look fine. They're going to look great, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I don't see the difference. I don't see why they, 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 you know, they used to, you know, allow themselves to charge you 10 extra dollars for the same thing. It looks exactly the same to me. Mm. Now the prices are kind of more like the same because I guess uh, Blu-ray is not selling that well. Exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I felt it was a ripoff. I will say that I see the difference, but I don't see it as a good thing. Is a weird thing. I do have the HD TV, so it's easier for me to see the difference. Okay. But here's the thing that people often forget about uh, 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 Blu-ray. A Blu-ray on a TV actually has a, a, a pixel capacity that's higher than one in a theater. It's higher than film. Okay. Yeah. So if you get a really good TV, which most people don't, but if you do, <laughs> yeah. uh, you could have a quality of image that's clearer, crisper, more defined than film. But here's the thing about film. Film at some point had a maxi vision as an option and then other options as well. Uh, well, such as filming digitally as well. Yeah. And filming from TV cameras as well. All of which actually allow a better, crisper image on film. And most filmmakers ended up having to reject it because it looked ugly. Really? When you watch a movie on film, you'll notice that the image is a little bit fuzzy. Just a little bit. It has that sort of dreamlike effect to it. Yeah. That's part of the experience. That's part of what allows your mind to sort of not freak out. Okay. Uh, they tried with Maxi Vision, where it's like, it's instead of 24, it's 48 frames per second. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And people watch it. A lot of people went like, wow, the image is so much clearer. But a lot of people went like, this is, this is giving me a headache because it's sort of hyper-reality at that point. Wow. Aren't we sort of ignoring the lessons learned <laughs> by going into higher and higher definition? That's an interesting point. Mm. I mean, I saw no problem with DVDs. Mm -hmm. DVDs were a huge step up from VHS. Oh, yeah. And I had no problem changing all my, my VHS to, to DVDs. But now, oh, this is new format, Blu-ray now. Change your DVDs to Blu-ray. No. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I see the difference. I And part of me, first of all, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, isn't it crisper? It's like, yeah, but it's the same freaking story. <laughs> like, I yeah. don't really care that much. And for action movies, you know, there have been people who have complained about Blu-ray, uh, such as the Blu-ray for Spider-Man 3. Uh, where uh, the transfer, because again, it's filmed on film, which is of a lower resolution, and then put into a format with a higher resolution, so they sort of had to clean it up yeah. for, for the Blu-ray. And where they didn't do it well, so that the, the background wasn't blurry enough for the eye to identify it as background, so it looked like everything was in the foreground. Oh my god. Yeah, the Spider-Man 3 Blu-ray, I think they redid it to sort of fix that, but okay. when it first came out, that was one of the big issues. Like It's all these little things where it's like, oh, we can have this great higher definition if you pay an extra $10. Uh, but when you're going to see it, we will have to not use that higher definition so that your mind doesn't freak out. Yeah. It's like, okay, then I'll, I'll buy the cheap DVD. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are they planning on getting rid of DVDs? 
or you know no not at all i mean okay. it's it's uh, nothing announced on that level and and frankly it's still selling better than blu-ray so i don't see it happening yeah no i i i i, I foresee blu-ray failing really they're going to come up with it with the next next generation and people are going to switch to that one all right uh that, that's, that's a lot of serious talk today isn't yeah, it indeed. yeah indeed so let's try to lighten the things up and we got our uh, typical little top three thing and since we've been talking about different formats, we felt that a good top three would be the top three formats that are major fails. Yes. I'll start us off with my number three pick for a format that was a fail. Now, I know I've talked a lot about music and games and uh, video, but this one is actually a format for books, which we didn't address. Yeah. But the whole tablet thing with the whole downloading of the books thing. Yeah. Um. I can see how it could be useful for, you know, guides and whatnot, because guides, that means you get the search functionality, which suddenly becomes yeah. mighty useful and all of that. But, like, for novels and all of that, I do not see the point to that. But people love their Kindle. They, they do. And, honestly, I don't get it either. I mean, the book and the Kindle cost the same, or, you know, the, the thing you download cost the same, and, you know, you can accidentally erase stuff on your Kindle. Again, it comes back to, you know, books aren't that bad. <laughs> I think the argument they say is that you can carry like 2,000 books on your Kindle. But, you know, on a subway trip from here to there, I'm not going to read 2,000 books. Yeah, well, even <laughs> on vacation, you're at the beach, you're near the water, you're near a bunch of strangers, you might want to take a dip in the ocean at some point, yeah? yeah. What are you going to do? Leave your Kindle or alone there? Somebody's going to steal that for sure. Now, I leave my book there? I don't have to give a damn. <laughs> That's true. Well, if it gets stolen, you won't know what happened at the end there. <laughs> And then, then there's the environmental argument. You know, the books with the transportation, they're heavy, they're big, they take a lot of space you know, yeah. with bookstores and whatnot. And that's a good point. But here's the thing. The book is made out of paper. Paper is a renewable resource. Yeah. You plant more trees, you get more paper. Yeah, now, now, now they're actually, you know, farms for trees. So, they, you know, they're not going to the virgin forest and cutting everything down. That, that was in the past. Now, you know, they try and predict the demand and there's going to be more demand for paper. We're going to plant more trees. Hmm. That's how it works. It's not, you know, oh, destroying version force for books. It's like, no, that's not how it works. The thing with your Kindle is that it's made out of plastic and uh, various metals. And, you know, plastic is made of petroleum, which is not renewable. And <laughs> which its non-renewability is the source of many a war yes. <laughs> in this world. So just throwing it out there if you're going to throw the big, you know, we're saving the earth argument for the Kindle. And don't forget, you know, the mail in there, the copper. Copper is like a real premium and prices are going to get higher and higher for copper. That's true. You know, because it, it, it's, it's getting, the electronics age is crazy and we're, we're running out of copper. So you really need that little, you know, gizmo to read the book that's taking out precious, precious copper. Or can't you just use paper? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Petroleum and copper, which are two non-renewable resources of which we are starting to lack. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's, so that's my number three pick. What's yours, number three pick? Uh, number three, um, cassette tapes for computers. Uh, maybe back, you know, back in the time of the Commodore and everything, that was great because it, it held more than the floppy. Right. But, I mean, in, in, in astronomy, you're st they're still using those for data. When you go to a telescope and you have your observing night, they give you a tape with, with you know, all the info. And it was like, well, this is the 21st century. Could we pro probably you burn us a DVD or something? I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> There's something wrong when, you know, these big... You know, what we imagine as, as laymans, for me, like you're not a layman, but I am, yeah. as these big high-tech things where people are sort of like defining new scientific concepts and finding new discoveries, yeah. that they're using the same thing that I use as a kid on my TRS-80. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was shocked the first time, you know, it was like, you know, and then they give you a tape and I was like, what's this? <laughs> Did you make me a mixtape while I was observing on the telescope? <laughs> All right, so where's your number two? My number two uh, format that is a fail is LaserDisc. Wow. Now picture this if you might. It's a very thin red pizza box. <laughs> and you need six pizzas to uh, uh, play Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the movie. Time to change the disc. Oh, yeah. Time to change the disc. <laughs> that's, that's the best part about it, you know. When you lose comfort, you know, when, you know, you're used to just sitting there and, you know, okay, you put the cassette in and it plays the whole thing 
and now you're you have to get up every 40 minutes it, it's a step backwards even though the sound quality the sound and the image might look better when you're asking people to do more work it, it's a step backwards whether you think you think it is or not all right what's your number two pick for format that is a fail uh zip drives oh yes for those who don't know those, those came out roughly at the same times that um, CD burners came out. And they were like kind of the next evolution of floppy disks, where, you know, you had the five and a half floppy disk, then the three and a half inch floppy, and then the zip drive was supposed to be the next one, where you could put like maybe 100 megabytes, I think, on <laughs> a zip drive. Oh my god, 100 megabytes? Yeah, as opposed to 700 megabytes on the CD that you could burn. And the zip drive the reader... It was actually more expensive than the CD burner. Yeah. Which was hilarious. <laughs> it was confusing too because it's the zip drive, but you know, zipping a file also existed back then, which was just compressing it so it's smaller. So, what's a zip drive? Does it compress the. F what's happening there? <laughs> yeah, no, I actually always wondered that myself. I, 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 I thought there was a connection between the two. And there's none. <laughs> Yay. Confusing. Good job. So with that, what is your number one? My number one pick, I am going in maybe a slightly different direction, but uh, the worst format for keeping information, in my opinion, is uh, the palm of my hand. Uh, I would like to ask all the girls who meet me to stop writing their phone numbers on my hand, because here's the thing. It really, really never happened to me when I was a teenager or in my formative years for dating. So when it happens to me now... Uh, I get pretty excited and pretty nervous and sweaty, <laughs> clammy hands happen and I lose the information. I have friends who, they're at their house and they, ha they, go, they need to go out and buy stuff at the store and they would write the stuff on their arm. It's like, you have paper right here, don't you want to use this paper instead of your arm? <laughs> it's just weird, the, 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 writing on the body thing is something I don't get at all. <laughs> it's and it, there's this sort of thing that where it's sexy and cool related to it, you know. Yeah. Like if, if if somebody else is writing on your arm, I can understand why that would be sexy. Like I'm not. Yeah. I, I could get the phone number thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm a writer. I always have a block of paper on me. Yeah. Always. You know, I, I never travel without it, and I often like get the paper out and already they're writing on it, and I'm supposed to go like, wow, that's cool. But like the first thing I do is just transcribe it before I lose it. Yeah. And I always feel like if they catch me, they're going to be super insulted. You know. <laughs> Uh, Alright, what's your number one pick for worst uh, format? Microfilm. Oh my god. And people think, oh, microfilm is a thing of the past, but no. I mean, I, I, I did my PG thesis, and I had to pay like $100 plus dollars to have it put on microfilm. I don't know why. Maybe they're expecting a nuclear attack, and like all the hard drives are going to be erased by the EM pulse, and my thesis needs to survive this, so that's why we have microfilm. Paper would also survive on yen peoples. Like, why don't you just press print? Uh, paper can be eaten by insects, I guess. Uh, can't you put it in, like, a plastic uh, sheet? Because that's, that's what I do with my paper. I put it in a plastic sheet when I want to keep it. I don't know. As the ASU library, or what I, all the libraries that now that require microfilm for thesis, I don't know why they, they think it's a great format. I guess it's tradition again, but it's ridiculous, and it's really expensive. And I don't know yeah, why I have to pay cool. for that. If you guys want to save it on microfilm, fine. You pay for it. Okay, I'll give you a flash drive with my thesis on it. I'm going to have to pay the flash drive like a buck at Best Buy. You can have that. If you want to make a microfilm of it, that's fine with me. I'm not I'm not paying for it. Because the cap and cold for films are, are incredibly expensive. Yeah. Microfilm is... A, well, all types of film are super expensive to make. Yeah. And to my knowledge, it's more delicate than paper. Yes, it is. And you need a specialized machine to read it, too. <laughs> so I never bought that as like, and, you know, the old professor was all you have to because that's the way it's done. But yeah, oh, come on, you seriously. Do you think like back in the back of their minds, they all have that James Bond fantasy in them? You know, like Sean Connery did it with microfilm. I'm, I'm, I'm using microfilm. I, I'm, a, I'm like James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose if you keep it in a big vault, it will survive a nuclear holocaust. Yeah. Do they keep it in a big vault? I think so. Okay, well, at least there's that. Yeah. Do they keep the machine reading it in the vault as well? I don't know. Because if they don't, there's a flaw in their system. And even if, if there's a nuclear holocaust, I don't think that people are going to care about uh, shortly renucleating injection in the solar system, okay? <laughs> They're not going to care about that. They're going to care about food and water. <laughs> yeah, but not immediately, I suppose. Yeah, but still, I mean... 
it's ridiculous. <clears throat> Maybe they can eat the microfilm, that's why they're keeping everything. <laughs> mm, mm, I am reading a Nirinja Award worthy <laughs> paper. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, that made me kind of um, very resentful of ASU, but then I learned it's everywhere. You're like, come on, get with the times, guys. You gave us two examples uh, uh, this week. It is shocking to me that the scientific fields are so down on technology. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, that's our episode. Um, if you have any questions, comment, please uh, write us at mail at thedreamersedge.com or post a comment at thedreamersedge.com. We're also on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. And we are also on the microfilm. So if you ever <laughs> want to have a copy of this for the Holocaust. Uh... The nuclear Holocaust. Yeah, not, not, oh, God. Whoa. Just, whoa. whoa. <laughs>